Amen. Well, good morning. Good to see all of you. And I tell you, when uh, I got a phone call on Friday that we were having trouble with our cameras, and our, our TV uh, coordinator, Ron Mack, said, you know, Bob, it's just going to be a wide shot. Now, when you are, you know, a small guy like me, um, a wide shot always isn't very, you know, comforting to have. But you know what? It is what it is. So as you all are joining us from worship at home today, uh, we're certainly going to do our best to uh, help get those close-ups, because I'm a good-looking guy, and I know you want to see me up close and personal. Uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you. We just have had a lot of storms, a lot of rain. I know many of you have tried to reach the church this past week, and our phones, the, the phone lines have just been saturated with water. And uh, some of you actually came and said, well, is everybody okay? And uh, thank you for doing that. It's just this, this sometimes that happens, and here um, we certainly get a lot of rain. So thank you for bearing with us. Well, I thought I'd start off with a little bit of a funny story today, and it's actually uh, to talk about a world full of taters. Okay, now you all know what a tater is. You know what a tater is, right? Is there anybody out here today? Anybody awake? Okay, all right. All right. I heard somebody shout from home. Thank you from our television church there. I appreciate that. Okay. Some people uh, never seem motivated to participate, but are just content to watch others do their work. They're called spectators. Some people never do anything to help, but are gifted at finding fault with the way that other do, others do the work. They're called commentators. Some people are very bossy and like to tell others what to do, but don't want to get their own hands dirty. They're called dictators. Some people are always looking to cause problems by asking others to agree. It's too hot, or it's too cold, or it's too sweet, or it's too sour. They're called agitators. And there are those who say they'll help, but somehow just never get around to actually doing what they promised. They're called hesitators. And some people can put up a front and pretend to, to, some, to be someone that they're not. So they pretend to be someone they're not. They're called imitators. And then there are those who love others. They do what they say. They fulfill what they promise. They're always prepared. They stop whenever something's in need. They always lend a helping hand. They bring real sunshine to people. Guess what they're called? Sweet taters. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, um, reading this morning's text, uh, it, it, it proves to me that uh, Nehemiah and, more importantly, the people of Jerusalem, as they're just walking around these ruins, that they were hesitators. You know, they had gotten to a point where, for over 70 years, they had walked by these ruins that were there. Uh, they had come out of captivity from, from the Babylonian exile, and God was trying to prepare their hearts in a special way. But as they came back, the walls of Jerusalem had been crumbled, the temple had been ransacked, and, and it laid in ruins. And just to give some um, perspective as to what this might have looked like, you know, at the Martin home, what happens with us is we get a little behind on our laundry. And I, I try to help Patty out, and, and I'm one of those guys that, you know, just doesn't bother to separate. Why not just put everything together and wash it together? Uh, but, you know, we get to a point where uh, in our laundry room, when you walk into the house from the garage, the laundry room, the basket's overflowing, and it has a way of making a big pile on the floor. And then all of a sudden, it becomes a point where it's so busy in the week that we're just kind of walking around it because neither of us has time to do anything. Well, that's what was happening in Jerusalem. The walls had been destroyed. They laid in rubble. It was in people's way, and they just kind of walked around it because it was just an everyday affair. They didn't know what to do about it. They didn't know how to fix it, and in some ways, they maybe didn't even care. Now, thinking about that, you, you might want to think that maybe they could have gotten a government grant. It certainly looked like a shovel-ready project, or they could have, <clears throat> they could have uh, gotten to a point where they could have maybe financed the new project or, or gotten to a, a way of, of trying to move that forward, but for some reason, they were just kind of in stalemate. They were coping. Now, that's what happens, isn't it? We, we turn into a people that, that copes. We cope with the situation. And sometimes when the situation doesn't uh, tra change or transpire the way that we want it, we just kind of cope with it and we go along with the flow. 
Well, what's happening here in this story is Nehemiah is getting a, a real burden. He's getting a burden placed on his heart, and that burden is coming from God. And God is saying to Nehemiah, you need to get to a point where this burden is so great that you're willing to do something about it. And that's why he's lifting this prayer up in chapter 1. In fact, if we look at this prayer, we see very quick, clearly that, that, that he is of a mournful spirit, that, that he is praying of the deepest levels of his heart, that he's fasting, and that he is doing everything that he can to focus upon what is needed in order to move forward to fix and to repair that wall. Well, you know, some of us, we kind of get into situations where maybe our walls are falling apart. You know, Nehemiah, it was uh, brick and mortar, it was um, stone, it was... Um, uh, sand and dirt and all those things. But, but for us, maybe the walls in our lives that are being torn down and the walls that lay in ruins for us could be relational ruins. Maybe we're, we're sitting in the midst of a marriage that has a relational ruin. Or, or maybe we're going through a financial collapse and, and our finances lay in ruin. Or, or perhaps we're looking at a new job opportunity because we've been unemployed and, and that opportunity doesn't come our way, so to speak. And we get to the point where all of a sudden our joblessness lays in ruin. So all of a sudden we begin to see that these ruins come and they live around us and these ruins are, are really a part of our life. But, you know, there's something, though, about the person who raises above the ruin. There's something about that person who sees that there's a need, who sees that there's a problem, who wants to be a part of the solution. You know, ever since I've, I've been a pastor, I've come to a, a, a different pr way of looking at things. And as a lay person, you know, sometimes I, find, I remember how it's so easy to see something that we don't like or something that we think is wrong, and we want to point that out, as small as it might be. And as I've become a pastor, I've, I've kind of put on both of those hats, and I've come to learn that sometimes we have to be a part of the solution rather than just pointing out the problem. And that's what was Nehemiah's role. Nehemiah was trying to come before the people of Jerusalem, and he was trying to say, I know that there's a problem, and instead of fretting and worrying over that problem, it's time that we all become a part of the solution. And there's nothing more exciting than someone who has that kind of fervor. There's something about that person that, that sees the need of, of wanting to move forward and to actually move and make a case to turn that which is wrong into something right. It's that person that has that I need to do something for God kind of attitude. Now I want to uh, show you, Marjorie's going to put up on the screen a little timeline that we're going to look at here. And this timeline is going to be important for us because we need to really get an idea of, of where I'm going with this. Now our timeline in life is that at one end is birth and at the other end is heaven. Are you seeing? So we're, so we're born into the world and at some point in time we die and we go on to life eternal through our relationship with Christ. Now you'll notice in the graphic that there's also a cross that's there. Now that cross represents that point in time in our life where we dedicate and we give our life to Christ himself. And it's at that moment that we release our own personal values, our own personal wants, our own personal needs, our own personal desires, and we release the lens of it being all about us. And when we accept Christ, we put on a new set of clothing. We become a new creation. And therefore, life is about God. But what happens is that we need to look at this uh, graphic and really take it in. Because there's some of us who will look and say, the moment that I know that I'm part of salvation's plan, I'm just ready to, to, to not do anything. I'm just ready for life to end. It's kind of like, you know, hello, Enterprise, Scotty, beam me up to heaven. It's time because I've been, I, I know I'm part of salvation's plan. But you know, that's not really the full picture of what God has for us. In fact, God says that, yes, salvation is a, is a huge part of that plan, but he also says it's an opportunity for us that in that timeline when we accept the love of Christ, that we become like him and that we are called for a purpose. In fact, Paul says here in Ephesians, he says in, in chapter uh, 2, verse 10, he said that we are God's handiwork created in Christ to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, this seems to bring up a lot of um, chatter amongst our churches today around the world because it's, it's kind of that salvation and it's kind of that, that works. And, and really, we have to go with what James has to say. And Jesus himself talked a lot about this. And James says, you can have all the faith in the world. You can know that you are a part of salvation's plan. But if you don't engage in works and somehow that your faith is dead without works. 
Now, like I explained last week, we're not a works righteous people. We don't think that we have to work our way to heaven. And by working, we don't think that we get like a, a book full of all these gold stars and then all of a sudden we've made it. But what we're saying, though, is that, that, that salvation is a part of that plan. And once we are part of God's family that we become the arms, the legs, and the hearts of God in the world. And that's where Nehemiah comes in, because he feels this burden. He's working as a secular cupbearer for the king, so he's serving the king. And he knows that the only way that he can begin this plan to go and to remedy and to bring back and recreate those walls of Jerusalem and rebuild them to revive God's people is to go to the king and to get the king to understand. And by God's grace and by God's favor, the king grants Nehemiah all that he needs. So we look at this and we know that, that that's the point of where we are, that you and I were created to do God's work. Now, do this. Uh, do you have a pulse this morning? Are you breathing? Are the carotid arteries, are they pumping blood to the brain? You know, if you answered yes, hopefully, to all three of those questions, if, if you've answered yes to those questions, then God has a plan in your life. And, and what God is doing is he's constantly inviting us to be a part of that plan. But so often what happens to us is we get caught up in, in trying to understand what that means. But, but God says that the plan that I have for you is a plan to be in your community, is a plan through your local church, is a plan in all of the things in the life, in your families, in the workplace, that my plan for you is to prosper you and certainly not to harm you. So Nehemiah had God's plan. He knew that he was being called to be that person to lead the people of God back together to restore that which had been put down into rubble because of the, uh, because of the exile. But how do we know what God's plan is for our life? You know, I think there's really a, a, a three-way three place that we can look at that. Now, here's how it usually works. When we want to know what God's plan is, what we usually say is, God, here's what I'm doing, or here's what I've done, now, come and bless it. I mean, you know, now, there's nothing like totally wrong with that, but, there, but it's still kind of mechanically not really the, the most theologically based way of doing that. Well, I'm doing this, so God just come and bless it. Now, a lot of good things come out of what we do, but, but I want to I get us to a, a bigger point here. And the second way to look at it is, you know, sometimes we wake up in the morning. Maybe this has happened to you. You know, God, what am I supposed to do today? Or I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. And we go into, you know, the scriptures and we go into Christian counseling and we talk to our pastors and we talk to our friends and we're trying, you know, I know God has a plan for me. Please tell me what it is. And we search for that. So that's really not the best way to do it either. But, but there's this third approach, and I want to lift this up as, as, as a standard for us to look at, not only as a church, but as a people of Christ. And that is, God, where are you at work now? And that's where I want to be. Does that make sense? God, where are you at work in my church? Where are you at work in the community? Where are you at work in our country? Where are you at work in your world? Because that's where I want to be. Now, the difference in those three approaches is that, that the first two approaches are that we're kind of doing it on our own. But that third approach is where is God at work? Now, let me tell you, God isn't always just at work at one thing. God is dynamic. He's not static. And so as we ask that question, we begin to know. Now, somebody who knows all about this is Dr. Bob Pierce. He's the founder of World Vision. And back in 1950, Dr. Pierce was actually touring through the Koreas, and this was uh, through, uh, through the wars and some other things. And, and what he began to see was this long line of, of Korean orphan children standing in food lines. And if that wasn't enough to, to really just uh, pull at his attention, what he learned by that was that, that the children that were standing in line ready to get the food, they were dying before they could even get the food because the food was not moving fast enough from where it was stored and where it was housed to the front of the lines. So he saw this atrocity of all of these children literally dying, waiting, standing there, waiting for food, and they couldn't get food there fast enough. So he went back to, to his office in Los Angeles, and he pulled together his business partners, and they came together with an organization called World Vision, which now reaches out and feeds millions upon millions upon millions who are in need. And another piece that we saw about that on one of his trips back to Korea, he met a, a little girl at the age of six whose name was White Jade. 
And what he noticed about her was that she had no money, she wasn't in school, she didn't have any housing or anything else. So he reached into his pocket and he had one thing left. It was a $5 bill. So he handed her the $5 bill and on that moment he made a commitment that every month he would send her funds so she could go to school, put clothes on her back, have a place to live and dinner. And he made sure that people were in place to do that. And that's a huge part of World Vision's mission today as they uh, come out with sponsorship of children. I mean, this is a guy who saw the need, who was impassioned by God to do something about it, who knew that, that he could really make a difference and reached out and by goodness gracious, with God's help, he was able to achieve something great for the kingdom's purpose. You see, this is the way it is for us. It all starts with that single heart-wrenching thought, that single heart-wrenching pull, that tug in our hearts that says that God is calling me to do something and to make a difference for his kingdom's purpose. You see, it's when we get that passion, and that's in my mind when we get that passion, we begin to understand the difference between, you know, maybe a personal perspective, something that I like to do, something that's easy for me to do, something that doesn't take much time or much care that I, that I will do. And it leads it into that bona fide thing that God is saying, this is why I created you. I want you to be in ministry with me. And I want you to make a difference. But here's what happens so often. We opt out. Now, you know, a lot of great people, a lot of good-hearted people, I'm one of them. You know, we, we want to do, we want to serve God. We love God. We want to serve him. We want to take care of our fellow people. We want to be in mission. We want to be in ministry. We want all of those things. But then when it really comes an opportunity for us to do it, if we're not careful, we opt out. And what I mean by that is we begin to start backpedaling a little bit, and we start thinking about the cost, and, and uh, oh, what's it going to do for my social status, and, and what are people going to think if they see me, you know, helping the homeless, or whatever the case, the example may be, or working with children in, in Title I schools. And we get to that point, and we opt out. You know, back in 1986, that happened to me. Patty and I, we had been married for a year. We had just embarked in a relationship with a, with a new church together that we were going to build our family in. It was San Lando United Methodist Church in Longwood, Florida, on the east coast of the state. And our pastor was pulling together a team of people at that time. You know, I had never heard of the little country called Haiti. And he was pulling a team together, and he said, it's opportunity for us to go into this um, little island that's shared with the Dominican Republic and to engage with the people and be in ministry and be ministered to. And I was thinking about, you know, all the positives that were coming from that. And Patty will tell you that God was really calling and impassioning me to do that. But you know what? Like two days before the plane was to leave, I opted out. Because I started thinking about, well, you know, there's, there's a lot of diseases and there's this and there's that and the water's not fresh. And what if I come down with, you know, this kind of fever or that or get sick? And, and all those things started going in and I ended up putting an excuse and I opted out. You see, God says that in those moments when he calls us, when he, when he wants us to make that difference, that, that you and I are to lean into his strength so that we don't opt out. And when we opt out, we lose perspective of what that ministry means, what that opportunity to be with God means. You see, as God works in our lives, we, we grow into fully developed Christians, and we, and we get to that point that, that we realize that, that part of being a believer of Christ, a follower of God, is that we become a people of compassion. And that compassion oozes over, and it allows us to spread by God's grace and by his help with the places that we want to go. You see, there's something that's happening in your neighborhood right now. There's something that's happening within your social networks. There's something that's happening in our schools. There's something that's happening in your workplace. There's something that's happening here in our local community. There's something that's going on that God right now is pulling the heartstrings on you at this very moment. That God is stirring within your soul a, a thought, an idea, a desire to take something that's wrong and to make it right. To pour your life into, to bring about a greater sense of hope that comes. And God is saying to all of us, here I am. Come with me. Come where I am and be in ministry. And it takes the opportunity for us 
to step forward. You see, too often, you know, we're, we're kind of pulling that back. And what God is saying in, in quite direct language is, he says, put down the hot Cheetos, turn off the Rays game, get off your butt, and go fight, fight, fight for the things that I'm calling you to do. And the question becomes, will we? And that's the battle that Nehemiah is faced with here. He's calling these people, and he comes into this community where they've walked around this rubble for 70 years, and they have no identity. They're not even worshiping, and he is so overburdened and mournful. He's crying his heart out, and all he's doing is he's reaching out, and he's inviting the people to be part of God's plan. Now, I'll tell you what, the people got so excited about this that not only were they going to rebuild the walls, but there were several gates that they needed to rebuild, like the water gate. Well, that didn't sound right. The gate where they bring water in or, uh, or the uh, food gate. And one family even got so excited, they got to rebuild the dung gate. I mean, think about how exciting that would be, that, that your family is rebuilding the dung gate. And that shows you how exciting it was for them to come together to work for that common cause with God. You know, when I ask the question, God, where are you at work in this local community? Where are you at work that we at St. Paul can be involved? You know, God has really answered that. And we define those through what we call strategic initiatives. Our church council has come together and they've, they've affirmed this direction for our church over the next three years that our human resources, our financial resources, and our spiritual resources will all be directed to these two initiatives over the, next two, over the next three years. The first initiative is to focus on community outreach and missions primarily in the Tampa Bay area. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not going to respond to, you know, some of things that are outside of the Tampa Bay area, but what it says is primarily our focus is going to be in, in coming together and serving and reaching out to the people in which our church is in the midst of. Now, wh where this is going to lead, just stay with me here, where this is going to lead is as we partner with people in the Tampa Bay area and we begin to share God's grace and we begin to make a difference with that, they then pass that on to someone else. And it's like dropping a pebble in the water that the ripple will just continue to go. Are you following me? You know, sometimes it's important for us to know that if we just walk across the streets in our neighborhood, we can be in mission. There are a lot of people that are hurting today and that our church, God's church, can make a difference in. The second strategic initiative is to build stronger ties to God and to each other through Christian fellowship, studies, and small groups. Now, this plays right into what Jesus said. Jesus said, you know, basically this thing called a new covenant, to love God, but more also to, in addition to loving God, love your neighbor. And what it's going to do is it's going to call upon us to grow deeper into our faith in God, our learning of God, and our understanding of God's word, and therefore also pouring in that we can love our neighbor, that we can love each other. And by pulling that in through small groups and studies and fellowship, it's an opportunity for us to do that. You see, as I ask that question, God, where are you at work in our local community? Where do you want us to be? I hear cries coming out from the local area. I hear people saying, we need a, a breath of fresh air. We need new wine and new wineskins, as the scripture would say. We need a touch of God. And there are people that are hurting every day that our church can reach out to and make a difference in their life. There are people who, who are in need of learning more about God, and all it takes is for us to reach out and to partner with them, to become a mentor in their life, and to make a difference for the kingdom's purpose. You see, our second initiative is the one that's going to push us out into a, a, a stronger direction. You see, a lot of churches, they want to get what we call wide. How many members do you have? How many people do you have in Sunday worship? That's a church that's concerned about being wide. You know what God's place on my heart? He wants a church that's deep. That doesn't mean that a wide church can't be deep or that a deep church can't be wide. But our desire as a church can't just be numbers. It has to be to grow 
It has to, to be, have God as our spiritual anchor, that we grow depth with that, and therefore we know what it means to be a believer. We know what it means to be a disciple. We know what it means to reciprocate the love and the peace and the desire of God. You see, Nehemiah heard of this great need, and he responded and he came before and he mourned and, and he told God, you know, God, I, I'm, I'm not calling you out, but he said, God, I am calling upon you to be the God to deliver the promises that you have promised your people. That these same people that don't have the energy, that don't have the desire, that don't have the know-how to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, to regain their identity, those same people are the ones that you led through the exile. Those are the same people that you led through the exodus. Those are the same people that you made covenant with. And God, I know that you won't forget them. But you know, sometimes when we're in the midst of rubble, we forget those things. We forget that God is near. We forget that God has made covenant. We forget that God loves us. Because all we can see is the rubble. And that brings about the fears. But Nehemiah came and he inspired God's people. And he said, it's time to rebuild. And what happens in this story that we're going to learn over the next couple of weeks is, not only do they rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, but they go back to a time of corporate worship. A thing that they had not done in so long. So God is calling the church of today, and I truly believe the church of St. Paul, United Methodist Church in Largo, Florida, that it's time to revive. It's time to have that heart for Christ again. It's time to raise ourselves out of the rubble. It's time to move forward. And it's time to see the kingdom's work and God's glory prevail. You know what? It's time that we take a brick and be a part of the solution it's time to rebuild the spiritual heart of God's church.